Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are live and we're going to talk about what happens when belief dies. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring a guest on who was once a devout Christian, just like I was. You're going to hear a little bit into his life and find out one of the reasons or some of the reasons why his belief died and what happens. So I really look forward to this show. I hope you guys uh, tuning in uh, will go check out his channel, by the way. It is When Belief Dies, and it's on YouTube. It's in the comment section right now if you're actively in the chat, pinned to the top. Also down in the description, if you're blind and you just don't know your way, way around, uh, that's totally understandable. Trust me, my mom and dad are dinosaurs, and you're just tuning in. Go subscribe. Check him out. Uh, he's a really, really good guy. And I have the Patreon. Guys, I cannot tell you how much is here. I keep saying this. Every show I do, I say this. There are probably three to 400 videos now on Patreon that just, I don't know how they're going to make it to YouTube at this point. So if you ever want to see them, join the Patreon. That's all I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen. So getting straight into this, welcome to the channel, Sam. Uh, I'm really glad to have you join me. Hey, Derek. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you. Yeah, we have some people in here who were here really early, and I, uh, I'm copying Doug you get a thousand Myth Vision podcast points, okay? Yes, that goes for my one black friend, and he's been around for a while, man. Thank you. Yes, you do. And of course, you've got some of your other early birds, you know? Man, bear, pig, you do get eternal Myth Vision, but there are different, like, you could spend these points in Myth Vision heaven however you like, and there's some benefits to it. You know, everyone who watches and is subscribed is that they're going to enter the gates. But the theme parks, those rides cost points. So let me know if you guys are interested in riding those one day when we meet after this world is over. Uh, <laughs> Sam, seriously, man, tell us what was your denomination? Where did you come from? Like, tell us your Christian background. And then we're going to get into the explosion of this deconversion process, which is a game changer. So tell us, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, obviously my accent, I'm, I'm from the UK. Um, hello, all you other UK watchers. Nice to uh, nice to be here. Um, so yeah, I essentially was born and raised in a Christian family. Um, it was a conservative evangelical family. Um, and essentially the sort of churches that I was part of would be your sort of um, either kind of classics uh, Church of England church, or it would be sort of like a Pentecostal church. There'd be um, sort of, um, you know, speaking in tongues, prophecy, gifts, signs, all those sorts of things. Uh, good, happy, clappy worship. Um, yeah, the classic, um, the classic sort of, uh, yeah, Christian, Christian upbringing that we'd, we'd really see over here in the West, especially within sort of, um, yeah, people these days within their sort of like twenties to thirties, that was sort of the sort of traditional, um, yeah, the traditional Christian, Christian backgrounds. That's, that's how I was raised. That's the sort of church I was part of. And eventually I ended up, um, kind of leading within one of these churches. Um, but we can get into that. We can get into that into, in, in, in due course. Yeah, so technically you were not part of the charismatic, non-denominational type movements, is what you're saying. Yeah, so I mean, I, I so I went to a Assemblies of God Bible College. Um, so I did a kind of like a full three-year degree program there, um, doing biblical studies and theology. Um, so that was a, a, a still a, still a denomination, but they had a lot of people who weren't denominational who were from um, a Pentecostal background. So ah. I kind of have a massive broad reach of people that I've kind of yeah, and and beliefs that I've experienced. Okay. Okay. I used to speak in tongues actually when I was in the non-denominational church. So I know yeah. all about the crazy getting into the moment type stuff, but uh, 
Yeah. Okay. So you were part of the church. How many years were you Christian? Good question. Um, so, I mean, I would technically say that I really, so born and raised as in my dad would sit down with me and my two brothers and he'd basically teach us God's word. So he'd sit there and he'd um, help us to understand what the Bible meant. And then, um, you know, as, as a teenager, as many people do, kind of backslid a little bit um, into drugs, drinking, sex, all the sort of classic stuff, um, had long hair. That was cool back in the day. Um, and yeah, basically ends up deciding I was going to recommit myself to a belief in God um, when I was about 17. So really kind of like a devout, strong belief that I wanted to um, live my life as if God's true, thinking that he was true. So it was mm -hmm. from the age of 17. And then I was probably about 27 when I really began to ask some big questions. And then probably about 29, 30 when I eventually stepped away fully. Holy moly, man. About the same time as when I started to do the same. It's kind of weird. Maybe we grow to a certain point and... I don't know if there's some science behind the the mind and the development uh, that we may have taken here. And at that point, we were just introduced to certain data or somehow we're able to look into this. But this is interesting. I, I share similar around 27 years of age is when I was looking into things I shouldn't have, according to the Christian uh, way of things. So, OK, you were in an upbringing. Your family was pretty devout for the denomination that they were part of. And. We could skip, I guess, some of the the, the drama there because I'm sure we could go into if you've had traumas and things like this and like obviously the ideology is really deeply seated that I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm broken, I'm worthless and God has to redeem me, this kind of mentality. But I need to ask because this is the fun part and we're just going to get right in. We only have 60 minutes and I figure why not have fun? What were the first steps that caused you to doubt that started to have you looking into areas you would have never looked. Do you recall? Cause sometimes people don't remember exactly the first thing. Like was there a certain video you saw a certain book, a certain person you talked to who bumped into you and said these, please. Yeah. So I think um, as humans, we all uh, essentially have a, a heuristic or a way of seeing the world. Um, and for me, Christianity was that heuristic. It was the lens upon which everything made sense. Um, so I was very much... Um, this is the this is the right way to live. This is what truth looks like. This is how we're this is how we're called to be essentially. Um, and it was through reading books like Sapiens by um, Yul Noah Harari, which really helped me to begin to step outside of just my sort of lens and actually go. Actually, there is so much more going on here, and there's so many other ways to view the world. Could it possibly be just possibly be that the way that I'm viewing the world isn't correct? Like there is something wrong about the way I'm viewing the world. Maybe God's still real and Jesus is true, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe how I'm actually viewing it and living my life doesn't quite make sense. And then essentially that started a entire domino effect where um, I began to question all the fundamental beliefs and all the propositions that Christianity said were true and began to find one by one. that actually they don't seem to be able to live up to the sort of classic. Um, yeah reality of, of of the world around us so it really was uh, stepping outside of my heuristics my lenses and going okay there are other ways of seeing this world what makes the most sense with what we see and experience and live and does that map onto christianity and i found that it that it, that it didn't okay so i'm gonna have to ask for examples right so maybe you can give us a few if you can remember one of the first ones or something but before you do that i just want to say for people i know exactly what you're talking about um, there's a confidence level that Christian apologists have on how true this really is. And I think it's false advertisement. I think it's better to push that this is faith and we trust that this is true. Not that we know, or we have like the confidence level for the evidence that they have is not, it doesn't match. So when someone like you and me, uh, I'm giving tips. So if you're a Christian, a pastor, a scholar, Mike, uh, what's his name? Mike uh, Render, whoever. You might want to take some notes from this. I think that, that when you present the confidence level of Christianity on such a high tier, that when someone starts to doubt the world view, they're so shocked at the 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 difference between what the reality is and what your confidence as an apologist that you're preaching at church is that it will shock your worldview to a point where you're going to have people deconvert even quicker than if you approached it like a lot of liberal Christians do and say, yes, there, there probably are contradictions. That doesn't mean God's message isn't coming across. Whatever, right? Like if you taught them a more liberal form, we wouldn't as fundamentalists who take this as God's word be so shocked. 
So Sam, if you could give us a few examples that you can remember, that would be wonderful. Yeah, sure. So I'll give you two that kind of feed quite nicely into each other. Um, so the first one would essentially be um, if you step back far enough and go, what are the heuristics that make sense with, with the world around us? Um, you begin to see a array of different times and people groups and ideas and cultures that have all tried to explain and make sense of and navigate this world around them. Um, so you can go to the Greeks, you can go to the Romans, you can go to the, the you know, the, the, the the Jewish people as well, and you can go to wherever you want and actually begin to understand that the Babylonians had a very set way of seeing things where they would put statues of gods outside cities that were meant to be kings to almost make their people think that the, that the kings above them were gods that were, should be feared and worshipped because this brought a structure to their society and helped them actually navigate and and, and, and live life. In a sense, you can just step yourself all the way back in, into the sort of original kind of homo sapien, if, if, you, if you will, someone who uh, was probably a hunter-gatherer that very much lived in small communal tribes that had gods um, within most things things um, and then you step far enough back and you get sort of um, Neanderthal man and we have we have burial sites of, of Neanderthal which have got uh, jewelry and, and and spears and with engravings in and things which clearly meant something to these people so you begin to realize that throughout the whole of human history and I view human as just more than just homo sapien like going back to sort of um yeah early man as well um, you see a desire to have heuristics that navigate and map out this world like you know man sat there I say man as in the the, the, yeah. the, the human race apologies I'm not trying to be sexist or anything and um, but essentially the 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 human race looked up at the stars and went what does this mean why am i here what's my purpose what's my position in this world am i am i anything am i am i everything and you see time and time again people groups making sense of things um so that was that was a, bit, a big one for me is realizing that actually we have since the dawn of time created stories and myths to help us make sense of the world around us and then if i may poke I can, in just just go, to go say yeah, what yeah. you're saying here and i'm just adding to what you're saying to get your thoughts so the idea that you knew that men, women, children, whatever, way, way back, were already trying to uh, come up with a worldview, a philosophy of the world they lived in that, that somehow made sense to reality. And they'd been doing this for a long time. So that alone, that heuristic worldview you're looking at is looking at the development of man from hunter-gatherer and even probably, I mean, as far back as we can even go, they're already mapping out uh, uh, concepts of, uh, what we would call uh, assuming agency outside of themselves, the stars or agents, things like that, because they move in different uh, ways in the sky or whatever, uh, planets or agents, however you'd like to do it, because planets makes better sense, actually, because they move. My point is, that did that start to make you go, why did God wait so long? I mean, were those questions that started coming like, why is man already doing this for a very, 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 very long time, yet only 2,000 years ago, my God shows up? Well, yeah, if you if you view that um, essentially that, you know, human history started probably about 200,000 years ago, you know, if, if Christ did actually come live, die and raise again, like we've only had him for what, 1% roughly. Um, it's yeah. it's it's insane. Like when you actually look at it, and then we meet my. I've got a great co-host for the podcast, a guy called Daniel. Uh, we recently spoke to Professor A. C. Grayling, and he he said it really really well. Essentially, he kind of turned around and said, you know, when 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 we didn't know enough, um, gods were everywhere. They were in the water, the trees, the streams, the hills around us. They were in the food we ate and and the people that we spoke to. And as science and and progression and thinking has moved forwards, the gods have moved further away and up into the. In, in, into the sky, the heavens, and then they're now outside of the heavens. Like yeah. we can't even we can't even reach them at all. So the, the the gods that we once thought were everywhere are now beyond our beyond our capability to reach and understand and comprehend. It, it just it just screams of um of yeah trying to make sense and trying to hold on to this idea of a god which you can't you can't grasp or, or knit back to the fabric of of the reality around us. It's amazing. I feel like the, it's like hide and seek, you know, and it keeps getting further and further. God's no longer coming down in the cloud at a tabernacle or showing up to guys on top of mountains. You know, he's outside space and time and, and uh, the complexity gets much bigger over time. Real quick, super chat from my friend, Harmonic Atheist. Has he reached out to you by any chance? My friend, Tim Mills? Uh, no, no, not yet. Maybe, but I've not seen anything yet. It's definitely something you should you should be interviewed by him. He's a wonderful interviewer, and also we're like sister brother channels here on Myth Vision and the YouTube world. He says, "Did you fear deconstruction was a satanic attack?" Um, I feared that Satan was potentially leading my mind astray, and that the end result of that would be a deconstruction, and therefore, like a literal hell. I, I believed and was raised to believe in in a, in a literal hell. Um, he says you will great thank you um and yeah i think it's it's definitely something that 
was in the back of my head, but at the same time, right? At the same time is if, if you're pursuing truth and you're pursuing knowing, knowing God's like, like literally on your knees, searching for Yahweh, the, 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 the God that came in human form that lived and died and rose for you because he loves you, because he knows you, because he wants to commune with you, because he wants to, you know, bridge that sort of sin, sin right. divide that has been created, then surely searching for truth would mean you will find and step into the arms of God if he's there. So yes, there was a fear of sort of satanic influence, but also very much of like, Satan isn't truth. God is represented as truth and the logos and the word um, within the Bible. And actually, if we went and searched for God, then surely we would find that truth there. So a little bit, but also not. Okay, I cut you off on your second point, and I hope you remember where you were at. Yeah, 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 cool. So um, basically, I began to then rework this within the Christian narrative and trying to make sense of, okay, so there's a story where essentially humanity has sinned in some way and we have got to make recompense for this fall, this sin, this issue that we've caused. Um, and so God has come in human form, died to rejoin us to God to be able to have a relationship and to actually know and to actually know this being and it's something that I mentioned when I was on the unbelievable podcast and I want to write more about this in the future but this idea of um, of essentially a string that goes back okay so you've got the string that goes back to the creation of everything so you've got the big bang or whatever it is there's a string that comes all the way to now so if you were to come and cut this string um, that would be the moment that humanity sinned so we're standing here in the present and we have this string in our hands and the question is is it taut or is it loose if it's loose it means at some point humanity has deliberately sinned against God God. And if it's taught, there hasn't actually been the ability for humanity to sin. And so I kind of ask the question, well, what is what is this fall of man? Like if, if we aren't able to to know that God is real, if we haven't ever had the option to go, okay, I literally know you're true and I'm going to reject you, then we're kind of coming up against this issue where we never actually had the free will or the ability to make a conscious decision to rebel against a God. And therefore, we haven't actually ever technically fallen to start with. This, this idea mm -hmm. of sin doesn't make sense that that, that that sort of rope is still taught from the beginning of time to where we are today sin hasn't come into the picture because it isn't isn't possible to have actually gone well god is true and i'm going to rebel against him like there's never been this sort of um accumulative effect of god's presence right. within a certain people group as far as i can tell it is interesting uh what you're saying makes a lot of sense someone in the chat actually said that uh they said if adam and eve didn't sin christianity is dead isn't it uh well I obviously think they're mythological characters, but nonetheless, this is a good point getting into sin. And are these just constructs that men develop? Uh, how did the system develop where right and wrong and things like that in this evolutionary uh, process, but also in their superstitious mind being animist, potentially everything, not just animals had spirits and they weren't gods, but like you said, the hills, the waters, etc. A few super chats I'd like to get real quick. My friend Gnostic Informant, everybody, he's been editing my content like crazy onto the Patreon. Go subscribe to his channel as well. And he might want to link up with you at some point, I'm sure. You guys could do some collaborative work. Have you lost friends on your path to truth yet? Um, an absolute ton of them. Yeah, it's been one of the most severe and painful experiences I have ever gone through. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to shit. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It's been, um, it's been awful. But mm. at the same time, I don't think I can stop. So um, I might as well just keep going and see who my real friends are. That's an interesting point. I might as well. I, you don't think you can stop, and you're being honest. I don't think I can too, because once you've opened this door, like. You know, the one thing that I'm doing is it's almost like you've already started. Don't stop. Where will this take me? Right. Like, I don't know where this is going to take me, but I see a brighter future for humans because once you've seen the little magic trick, as I always use as an analogy at the David Blaine show, everyone's mesmerized by their God, their particular religion. And the guy in the corner is going, hey, come here, let me show you how it's done. Let me watch you. Let me show you how he levitates. Right the walking on water, the rising of the dead for Jesus' sake, etc. You see how this is either myth, it's not literally true, it's created stories, it's mimesis borrowing from other stories, and who knows what the reasons for their original creation are, etc. Um, you, you begin to realize like humans in general, it's a human thing. It's not, oh, this one's right and that one's wrong, and it's all of this tribal stuff that we have that's divided us. You kind of look past all that. You go behind the curtain and you're like, if people could see the magic trick for what it is, I don't think we'd hate our neighbors as much. I don't think we would have the problems that we do have as much in the world, but it is replacing it with a humanism. I mean, obviously you can go to like horrible examples of people who claim to be atheist in history, ruler of Russia, et cetera, that kill their own people and stuff. Are they really humanist? 
do they set good examples? No. I mean, what, what is their ideology? And it's obviously not seeing humans on the same playing field, you know, a lot of racism in the world, et cetera. So anyway, uh, another super chat scripture skeptic came on the scene. And he super chatted. Thank you so much for all the super chats. But he also says, sorry, forgot the question. <laughs> hey, I didn't know the answer anyway, so don't worry about it. Um, Sam, am I taking us off course? Tell us where, where should we go now that you've realized there's some holes in the narrative. It didn't quite make sense with reality and your research in the world that we live in. What happens to you? You're now doubting or you already like, I, I like just those two things alone brought you out of the faith. And then what happens? I mean, I don't know where, where to go from here. Yeah, I am. Um... I told uh, my church leaders essentially that I was having some severe issues with my belief system and that I didn't think that the the, the claims of Christianity were true. And um, essentially over the course of the next year and a half, I was encouraged by them. It was a fairly big church, about 400 people, um, to um, essentially move my family and me out to um, out to a town just outside the, 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 the city that we lived um, to essentially begin to serve at a more local church, to begin to really get back to the grassroots of what Christianity looks like and to try to um yeah find god in that in that serving so um being an idiot i did that essentially um chat to my wife and we agreed that we'd do it so we moved out um out here and i i honestly was I just on this position where i was like okay maybe i'm wrong maybe this these doubts will go away maybe i'll be able to find god once again and really reconnect with this with this being i thought was there um essentially moved out here and then of the course of the next year and a half essentially after that so it's three years from doubting to kind of really stepping out that i began to realize that um no it is completely it is completely false. I don't believe this anymore. And um, it was just one of the most painful experiences stepping away from church. So I was leading the church, uh, one of the elders there. I was regularly preaching. Um, I absolutely love the people. I don't get me wrong. Like it was an incredible little little church with some amazing people that just want to serve their community, which is fantastic. But I couldn't believe it anymore. And then found that when I left, there were just some... Um, really awful experiences where individuals would you know just not speak to me anymore or um almost warn other people about coming to even meet my wife so we've got we've got two little boys um now six and three um, and they would yeah thanks man um and they, they would basically warn my wife about meeting up with her and the two kids if they had kids in case that i'd influence her and the kids and they were going to then begin to make other little atheist pockets within the within the church community so it was just a really weird um a really weird uh yeah ex experience for me essentially oh my gosh man uh, that's sad you know what i mean that is sad i definitely have dealt with my own fair share of losing friends and then the community i was part of but i, I i've always moved from one thing to the other i never sat in one spot so i was never raised in like one view I always pushed the limits and went to the next idea or my denomination changed. And I went from like speaking in tongues to a Presbyterian in the PCA church. So that's a whole nother story. Samuel and Mar uh, Marika Adams. Thank you so much for the super chat it says, I feel the loss of friends too. Seems like most Christians cannot accept the concept of reasonable unbelief. Our sincerity is doubted by default. Did you have that experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's definitely it's. I mean, it's, it's it's definitely true. Our our desire to be completely honest and go, I don't know what's going on here, and I want to go and explore the the this 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 position I'm in and work out what's true and what's real and stuff. And there's 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 a doubt laid laid in that by many Christians. I mean, you see it within apologetics as well that mm -hmm. you know they they no longer believe because they want to sin or they want to live this lifestyle or they they want to live free or whatever it is. And actually, there's, there doesn't seem to be a a acceptance with any Christian apologist that I've spoken to on the podcast or off the podcast to, to say, I, I see you for you. And I see that you have doubted and that you're in this position and it's not your fault. Like it isn't, isn't something you've deliberately done to try and um, coerce your way out of a belief system. Like you've, you've literally found a hole and you've fallen through this hole and you no longer believe. And you're now on the other side of Christianity, looking back going, well, I can't go that way. So I might as well go this way and see where this is going to lead. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I agree with Sam a lot. Let me ask you this question, because this goes in the vein of what you just said. If by definition something is to be truth, all right, and we're supposed to seek out the truth, we usually always started with the presupposition that what we were told was the truth. But we're, we kind of go into the apologetics arena in a way. I'm not saying you were out there doing Frank Turek stuff. I'm saying online we engaged and we were researching and we wanted to find truth. And what that meant was wherever it went, we would go period. So we start to look at it and we did it for the longest with the cognitive dissonance and bias of this is true. Let me hear how the other apologists have dealt with this. 
and some of the claims like all oh, these older religions that look like Jesus, uh, Mar you know, look at Justin Martyr saying Satan knew. Satan knew long ago, and he, he made these religions to, to throw people off track. That's why they look similar, or there's commonalities, or things like that. And you go, what? Or did Genesis borrow from the Mesopotamian flood myths? No, 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 no. Uh, there's no borrowing. Even today, one of the more uh, progressive ideas of apologists, we have Michael Jones. And he's, um, what is his channel called? Uh, I always forget his channel name, but I've interviewed with him. He goes, no, there's no intertextuality. You can't prove they used literary connections from Genesis to the Mesopotamian mythologies. But other scholars say they're there. I want at first longest. I was like, no, that's all BS. That's not true as a Christian. But you really keep digging because you're like, what if I'm wrong? At some point, you get so honest that you're willing to take a scalpel and do a little surgery on your own epistemology your own foundation. And when you do that and you see what the hell's going on, that's when it happened to me. I, I I'm just, is that what happened to you? Yeah. I think when you, when you begin to realize that the worldview that you have isn't correct and that you're holding on to presuppositions just because you need them to be a foundation to hold the rest of it up, you, you begin to realize that actually if you, and, and I think, I think, I think there is a choice in this. There is a choice to, um, I don't think you can get away from doubting, but I think there's a choice of whether you want to allow the doubt to lead you or not. And I definitely was like, well, if there is any doubt this isn't true, um, I need to know that. So I'm going to just go and explore. I know some people that are still within the church or um, I used to work for a Christian organization as well who who do doubt that it's true, but have decided to just ignore it and just yeah. carry on with what they're doing. But I always thought like when I know this might sound like wishy-washy or whatever but when i get to the end of my life I like to imagine i'll be on my deathbed and i'll be thinking about like the sort of life that i lived and i want to know that i've got to that point knowing as as much truth as i can or getting as close to truth as i can if it's even possible to get to truth and actually being mm -hmm. being as honest as i can with the world around me and allowing the things that have um needed to be in place to fall away and, that, and that's that's the hard process right it's almost like when you when you step outside of a, of a of any religion um you realize that essentially the, the bricks get taken away the roof comes down you then stand up and it's like you're standing in dust with nothing around you like well i, I need to start walking along this journey then and actually going well, what what does what does a family look like without god what does what does morality look like how do i live an ethical life should i even care about an ethical life like you begin to ask these questions because every everybody asks these questions when you step outside of, of a religious framework and you begin to go i can rebuild this and there's so many other foundations and so many other amazing thoughts and ideas and, and philosophies that can help you to begin to pull things together i'm doing a series at the moment on on stoicism um ancient greek um essentially um, philosophical framework which um like a like a classic one was almost like um living as if this was the last time you do something so um mm. for many of us there was a last time that we were picked up by our parents okay so if you had parents who picked you up there was a last time that you were picked up by your parents which means for your parents there was a last time that they picked you up so i've got two little boys right so i also think of myself as i pick them up and they're getting heavy flip me they're getting heavy they're getting bigger i'm like is this is this the last time that i'm going to pick up my 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 baby boys it might be like 21 whenever but they'll still be my baby boys like, is this the last time that i'll be picking up this person and and actually living in that moment of, of realizing how special this is right now, you begin to appreciate the world around you so much more. Like, is this the last YouTube live stream I'll, I'll do? Like, who knows what's going to happen in, in like an hour's time? You just don't know. So live now, live in this moment, enjoy what you can here, because this could be the last time that anything takes place. And, and that's a really special thing and position to live in, I think. So, yeah, I'm that's talking a very No, no, no. That's there's I've got a couple interesting kind of uh, proverb type parables, if you will, that, that go into the vein of that. Real quick, we've got Indo with the super chat. My friend, thank you. Appreciate the support. How did you use to justify atrocities in the Bible? How do you view them now? An example would be gay people put to death or 42 dudes, or really their kids, uh, killed by bears. Um, you go first. I'd love to add my own little toss. In yeah, there. Obviously, being being bald like Elisha, I thought this whole like bear killing, or like um, I think she bears killing the children was absolutely justified. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, I um, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> sorry, it's just a really bad bald joke. I was like, whoa. Um, <laughs> I I always viewed it as um, essentially God's God is a God of judgment, and we don't like to 
view that when when we read the new testament and the old testament we we, we very much like to create a creator god who is just loving and great and he really enjoys you hanging out with him on friday evenings and that like you know youth worship service whatever it is and this this god of feeling of emotion of of just care um and actually if you strip that away and you look at the actual the actual text themselves you, you you come to realize that god is a god of judgment and wrath and um you begin to see that playing out in in patterns um throughout the whole of the bible and um if you see something like these atrocities or these these commandments by god um how i used to view them was god was setting his standard and he's saying if you do not hit the standard these are the consequences that you will live in. Um, now, I never turned around to people you know, who, were, who were gay or whatever and said, you need to stop being gay. That is completely wrong. You quit that sinful behavior because I have my own shit that I am also aware it does not meet God's standard. So I should, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, sorry, I should rather did. Um, yeah, so right. I should, um, cool. You're fine, um, so you I can. should <laughs> do what I want. Um, basically, so I have my own stuff that I need to recognize doesn't hit God's standard. So who am I to point the finger at other people? And so going back to the text, as, as the question asked, if I read that in the text, I would have said that's God who is theoretically perfect, living out um, his justice or dishing out his justice upon the world. Um, I can't judge that, but I can allow his judgment to befall me. So um, it, it's, that sounds very, very dark and very heavy, but that's how I would have rationalized it um, if I was asked it when I was a Christian. To just go on to what you said there, the way I rationalized it, and it was a really interesting question. We started in the in the Protestant versions of Christianity, and I, I don't know because I was not a Catholic, but I would think the same applies there. Once you start with you are clay, right? But you're not just any clay, you're broken. You are your great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, fell, right? Um, we are all deserving of absolute destruction from God because we are as wicked as you can be. Your righteousness are dirty rags, right? Preached from the pulpits of Protestantism. Don't know about Roman Catholicism, but I think it's in the vein of all of it as well. And you are deserving the worst. So God having bears kill 42 kids for mocking one of his holy prophets. No problem. Go kill every man, woman, and child. No problem. We deserve far worse than that. Like that's the mentality. So justifying God as this wrathful being is really easy uh, when you're in the, the bubble and the glasses are on. I know it sounds crazy, but I even started to try and swallow the pill as a Calvinist that God had predestined people to burn forever. And I said they deserved it. It's his creation. He could do with it. But then like when you actually think about what you're saying and thinking in your head and you actually start to go, I love people in this life that I would kill or die for that according to my own worldview in my head will be cooked and burned forever by this God. I started to like, think about these things. Like how could I love them more than God does? Because I accepted as a Calvinist, I started to accept God loved some and hated some. It's clear in the text. Jacob, I love Esau. I hated. He prepared for destruction. He prepared for glory, et cetera, et cetera. I started accepting it. But I never really swallowed the pill, bro, because once you start looking at how can I love people more than God, it really started hurting, you know, and I couldn't I think I threw that pill up and it never dissolved. So, well, that's it. The this sort of classic Christian narrative isn't sticking to you. And it, it comes back to the whole idea of, of, of who cut the string. Like what, what what is this fall that took place that we were supposedly involved with that has meant that we are now living out the consequences of it without any ability to change the narrative or to or to mix stuff up. And if you believe that Jesus did come and die um, and and rise again for your sins, the people before him weren't able to live in that freedom. So imagine being a Jew 500 BC. Imagine knowing that you you can afford to get to the temple to sacrifice to atone for the sins that you know you that you've committed. So therefore. God's judgment is going to fall upon you. Um, it, it's, it's crazy to think, and, and, and you can kind of begin to understand why this need for a all-covering sacrifice was so important to the Jewish people, especially around 33 AD when, when the Roman Empire was were, were gearing up to mm -hmm. essentially wipe out the Jewish people. That was starting to happen from the various messianic movements happening at the time. Like You, you, you can kind of see that the, the, the judgment that's been placed, the desire to rectify that with sacrifices, people not being able to get there because of the po poverty and the state of the situation within Palestine at the time, and then people beginning to create this idea of, of a Jesus who can enable them to live a life free of this sin that they've created in the first place it just seems so yeah. weird i mean it's just ancient fables of course that we have kind of regurgitated and kept passing on so it's an interesting thing let me ask you this you now 
are absolutely doubting you left the faith, what happens when belief dies? What starts to replace it for you? Yeah, I think the search for the answers outside of Christianity. So um, kind of mirrored with the search for is any version of Christianity true or any religion true as well? So um, not necessarily just going, right, I'm done with all religion. Forget that. I'm moving on. Just because Christianity is yeah. false, I'm an atheist. All of a sudden, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it. it. I've, I've jumped ship and I'm, I'm done. Um, no, it, it was it, it was much more of a, this sort of exploration of, um, okay, so what is true in this world and how can we begin to make sense of this life? And, um, and, and this is why I started blogging essentially because I know that loads of people either have or will go through exactly this this moment of completely nasty believing to going i don't believe it's true it's literally not true in my mind and i can't i i, I often say this on the podcast but I, I don't think we are in control of what does or does not convince us mm -hmm. to be true so if something convinces you that it's true i don't think you're actually able to go well, no it's not like of course because if you're convinced it's true you're convinced it's true there's no way you can get away from that and i was convinced christianity wasn't true so when belief dies essentially it began to become this way for me to blog my deconstruction all the way through to sort of agnostic atheism which is where i am now um, and then yeah i began to kind of have conversations with friends which then morphed into the podcast which then morphed into youtube and is kind of where we are today talking to scholars and experts much like you um on on various topics but essentially it's it's, it's a desire to explore this space openly and freely and go isn't it amazing to hear all these viewpoints and to not have to go i'm going to pin my colors to this one right and go right that's amazing. You can explore this and not go, I'm now committed 100% to this thing or else I'm going to burn full time. Like that doesn't have to be the option, which is great. Yeah. And I think exploration's a good thing. Even if you never came down on the atheist side, you can always remain agnostic, so to speak about things that's respectable to me as well. Cause I, I, I call myself an atheist, right? But for me, when I left Christianity, I did the same thing. The exploration was the six wise men of Hindustan. I mean, to me, it was okay. Christianity isn't it. I saw through it. As you know, that is what we see. We now know and we see this, okay, we've been kind of duped with this message and this was all there is, but God had a very powerful grip on me. When I made God bigger, because I couldn't let go of God, I was able to let go of this thing called Christianity, but God himself was much bigger. And I saw patterns. I said, okay, all of these religions, very similar themes there's always a hero with a with a, a decline then he rises and he's the man with the plan and all of this stuff i said wow god is expressing himself in all of the cultures in different ways and then to me it was like the six blind men who went to see the elephant but none of them really knew what they were touching and that was it but god lost its power it, it wasn't as powerful in my life because it was kind of woo woo it was out there and then I asked myself the question, what's the difference between this pantheistic God just is? There's no active like being in your life type thing, but it just is and no God. And to me, I didn't see any difference. If there is a source, let's just say, that is beyond space and time, neither I nor the believing Christians or anyone else knows. That's my my. I mean, people will act like they know. They may have had some type of experiences, I, but there are natural explanations to give people why. The, what makes more sense, right? Uh, if my wife got pregnant, let's just say, and I haven't been home in you know two years, I'm not going to say this was an angel or a spirit or something made her pregnant. No, I'm going to automatically assume, yeah, she definitely cheated or something else bad happened sinister or whatever other natural explanation the least likely probable explanation is gabriel or god or holy spirit or whatever impregnated my wife um once you start using that kind of epistemological approach to things though people go well, you're not allowing the supernatural you're not allowing and it's i don't know how do how do you deal with stuff like that what have you had a lot of that happen to you as in those questions yeah absolutely yeah. so um a, a classic one that i like to say is okay so let's say god's real um what god could do to help everybody know that he's real and that the supernatural is true is say um every single person that walks through any church door is instantly healed of let's pick anything cancer right so whoever has cancer walks through a church door automatically healed at that point we would go 
okay, this is weird, right? There's yeah. so much stuff going on. How do we begin to explain this? And that would stir the entire world into this frenzy of what is going on. This is absolutely incredible. Forget chemo. Let's get them to a church. Like that, that would just change. That would change yeah. the face of belief completely. But God doesn't do that. God decides to, if he's real, reveal himself in ways that aren't attainable to test and to experience and to know to be actually from God. Um, you mentioned sort of, um, you know, trying to understand how someone's pregnant after not being with them for two years. And it's this kind of thing you, you can you can see how the disciples, when they realize that their 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 Messiah, if you believe Jesus was literally real, that you see the disciples realize that their Messiah has has died. They don't know where he's buried. Potentially, they're trying to work out what this is. Somebody has an experience. They're like, okay, well, I'm, I'm I, I really believed in this person. I put all my weight into it. I, I gave up everything for this. And you can really understand how cognitive dissonance begins to force people to make decisions and assumptions that they are able to make the best sense of a situation and to try and put it into a position which is completely and utterly unattainable but yet makes sense to them from the feelings and thoughts they had and there's there's a great book called um doubting jesus resurrection by chris k i can never quite pronounce his surname um really really good book and he he basically goes into a, a, a variety of different situations where um there's been prophecies at the end of the world or god's going to return or whatever it is and it doesn't happen so Correct. people don't just stop believing they begin to believe even more crazy things to try and overcome that doubt. Oh, of course we were wrong. God's actually not going to come then. He's going to come then. And then when that happens, oh, of course we're wrong because God didn't come in, in person. He came in heaven and he's now ascended to the throne. And that's what the whole movement was. We, we just consistently try and, and make sense of situations because we aren't able to step back and look at the belief and go, there's something fundamentally flawed about what I'm believing rather than going and admitting that we're going, let me try and explain it in any way I can. Um, and you see yeah. that with, with yeah, religion. I mean, look at this is a horrible, horrible example, probably, but Heaven's Gate, right? These people literally committed suicide, poisoned themselves with cyanide, from what I understand, because Jesus was in his spaceship traveling over Earth at a certain time. And they believed that we are now going to leave the body and go up to be with Jesus at this moment. So they commit suicide. Everyone finds them dead in their beds, all peaceful, arms folded and everything, ready to go. They're delusional, right? And I don't mean that derogatorily. I mean, like, they're really convinced you wouldn't do that if you weren't. It's And now a much more horrible story is Jim Jones, where there are people who didn't want to do these things, um, but they kind of felt pressured by the social aspect. And so, yeah, getting to the source of, if we we're trying to explain what happened with the Jesus movement, there are different plausible theories. Like what you talk about with cognitive dissonance, I think that would still play a role. Even if we wanted to say some people were so close to the man, if the man existed, that it's like losing a brother or a son or something. And then they have a post-mortem a few days later. They're, they're not eating. They're probably not sleeping right. They're terrified for their life. And they experience some type of vision or they hallucinate and they say, I, I saw the resurrected Lord. And of course, the legends build within the Gospels. So it's easy to explain the origins of Christianity. And the last probable thing is that this actually literally happened. Then you take that scalpel. You're as a Christian. Christians are used to doing that to Hinduism, to Muslim faith, to Judaism. They'll do it to any other religion. And I do it to all of them. Like I, I just do it to all of them now. It's like, all right, well. And they're willing to do it to that, but they can't with their own. And we know why, because we were there. So as your journey continues, your belief has died. Where are you at right now in your journey? It seems like you're using some really good uh, Stoic philosophy. You know, someone mentioned Marcus Aurelius, right? Really wonderful, brilliant minds throughout history who are using this philosophy to try and face death that we all have to face at some point. I thought about this three nights ago as I was going to sleep. I was, you know, fear of death. You had a show you did, a podcast, just for everybody to see on psychedelics right here, right? What, what the heck is the history and all that? You're taking deep dives into stuff that I like getting into as well. That's why I encourage everyone to go subscribe. Um, but where are you at in your life right now? I call myself an atheist, right? Because I just don't have, it's not like I'm agnostic, like, well, it could be this, it could be that. The natural world seems sufficient enough, but I'm not closed off to something being there. I just don't have the evidence here. There's just nothing there yet. Um, what, what are you, where are you at? 
It's a great question. Um, it's, it's one that I come up against time and time again. I mean, I, I have no issue with with the term atheist or agnostic. I think they're right. they're both addressing different things. So when I say when I come to the to, to, to the Christian gods, I'm now atheistic towards and I think positively atheistic towards that. Like I, I take a right. position where I will defend my like atheism and that God doesn't exist um, and, and do that quite ve uh, fearingly or whatever the right word is um yeah. so yeah I, I i'm i'm an atheist in in that regard i'm 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 agnostic to there being um something outside the universe that we can't quite touch because it's outside the universe we can't quite touch it so why are we trying to engage with it or understand it like it's just not going to happen um and then to all the religions within the world i'm really happy to explore them and see what people think but i will be as critical as I possibly can to really get under the sort of why why did humans believe this to be true what is it about this sort of um I don't know this 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 um I don't, let's, let's pick a random a random god this Hindu god x why 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 do they believe in x why do they believe that x reincarnated this person how do we begin to understand these myths or or even Buddhist kind of um religious texts like there are some amazing atheistic Buddhist religious texts and there are some absolutely wacky supernatural bits in other Buddhist texts as well and we can go okay well actually there's some really interesting things within Buddhism we can take out and leave behind the supernatural stuff because we can't prove it we don't know if it's real it's just people's experiences potentially so it, it, it really is about kind of exploring this space so um yeah I mean I would call myself an agnostic atheist I think Ricky Gervais said it at once which was really really helpful so I'm essentially um agnostic because I don't know so do I know that that, that God's um that God's there or not know there could be a God somewhere. And what um, we mean by dog, God, dog, I hope everyone understands what we're saying when we say that just something, a source, a power of some type of being anything that is beyond uh, the universe itself, potentially, or the universe itself is a God, right? Like pantheism or something, you know, this is where you're coming from. I, I've, I've got a super chat here. I want to get, and uh, I always favor the super chats because they help me keep going. Did you ever feel unworthy after leaving religion? Did it seem that all around you were disappointed in you? If so, how did you cope? I did, but I'd love to hear your. Yeah, I think this this is one of the most painful things. So, I mean, I um, I've always I've always believed that I was called by God to teach His people His word. So that's the sort of calling that I've had spoken over me since I was a really young boy, and something that I've I've lived into um, myself um, for most of my life, really, and. Um, when I realized that I could no longer live into that calling, it was um, awful to see um, the the variety of responses to to it and how easy it was for people to not care and not get involved. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely so many people that that walked away and turned away and um, and haven't come back to me since they've gone, oh, OK, and then almost shut the door and just walked off. Um, so, yeah, it's been it's been really, really hard, really, really hard for me. The hardest, I think, is family. Like my mom and my brother and people like that kind of looking at me like you were the guy who held the, you were the glue in the family that held faith together for all of us. I was the guy like you're talking about who everyone thought was going to be a pastor of a church. I actually was going to college for it. And uh, really, they all now look at me like the crazy thing is they all knew that I studied unbelievable depths when it came to researching this stuff, getting into the Bible, started taking college courses on this stuff, really getting into it. No one in my family has near like, and I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying I was extreme. I'd spend ridiculous hours neglecting my family, my wife and kids to focus on studying God's word and to be focused on the ministry. And when I left it and I did all this and said, look, uh, I don't find it true anymore. The craziest part was they trusted me on everything I said when I was in it. But then when I left it, on any matters of faith, God, religion, you name it, everything, they ignore me on it. They do not believe anything I say. Nothing I say has any value. And you really feel like the black sheep. But at the same time, this is the lucky part about me is, is I was a drug addict for many years who struggled with addiction. When I got clean and I also became a, a skeptic, if you will, who then becomes atheist, um, I they can't blame, they can't go, it's not working for you. Whatever it is that you did, it's made your lifestyle way worse. You're not as good of a person. No, I, I'm better than I ever was. And I care even more now than I ever did. And they're like, but they still can't let go of the faith. So interesting note, though. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'd love to hear what you have to say. 
Yeah, I mean, one, one of one of the things that I really struggle with is the reality that the hell is quite a big thing in in the sort of, um, especially evangelical kind of church movement here, here in the UK, some sort of literal hell, um, and where people generally now now believe that because I no longer believe, I'm going to raise my children in a different way to how I would have raised them, and there's a very strong chance that my children will end up, you know, burning for all time because of my belief system. It's it's it's, it's almost like there is a trajectory that people saw me going on, and now that I'm going on this trajectory, they're like, well, this is this is all the fallout, Sam. This isn't the fruit this is the fallout of what you're going to do you're going to condemn your wife your family to hell you're going to live a sinful life you're going to blah, blah 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 like all the classic christian memes um it's, it's crazy it's just really really crazy something that happened to me too sam uh as i left you know we talked about we left christianity okay let's just go ahead and assume it's false for everyone viewing right now we recognized it's false and we for the problems that it had so then we start exploring, looking at other religions. For me, I looked at Judaism, right? And said, well, it came before Jesus, but it was so close in terms of, I was so used to going and engaging in this content that I started going, does this God even exist? Because we're borrowing from this. So I was familiar with the work enough that when I listened to skeptics and scholars and stuff on this, I started realizing this doesn't fit. Plus, I saw how the groups that followed the religion were engaging with one another and with people on the outside. So it's almost like I didn't need to go and read, you know, the Quran. I didn't need to go and read the the all of Hindu religion in, in order to know because someone might go, you might have missed a religion on Earth that was true. I There's no way I'd be able to exhaust every religion on planet Earth to know all of their religions. It's interesting to explore them and know what they believe, why, how their myths developed, et cetera, et cetera. But notice how I said how their myths developed. What happened to me is I started to take a science, scientific approach, like you talked about, looking back, realizing, hold on, at one point we were hunter-gatherers. What was the evolution on these concepts and where did they come from to begin with that predate all these? Once you've done that, you've technically undermined all the work. If you were really trying to find the true religion amongst all the thousands that are out there, you wouldn't even have to do that. All of that gets kind of shortcutted when you recognize why people believe in things to begin with, why do we assume there's agency in objects that we now know? Well, that's a that's a tree, like you know, that's not this god or that god, or or lightning isn't Zeus throwing thunderbolts down from heaven. We now have natural means to explain these things. When nine out of ten of those things are explained, and before we only knew one out of ten, nine was mysterious. We could we could put gods to those things. We didn't understand them. Science has developed. Now, nine out of 10, we don't have the answers to some things. Sure. Like what happened before the Big Bang or what is that? You know, maybe we can't even fathom in our in our bubble that we live in called the universe. We don't get it. That's fine. Who knows? The point is nine out of 10 are now the gods don't they're not the ones doing those jobs. So when God's out of a job and you get to the last 10th one, do we need to posit God? Or is it possible just like the nine out of 10? There's a natural means of explaining it. Don't know. It's fascinating. I think. I mean, one one of the one of the, the one of the big things I've already mentioned, and I think is important to reiterate, is is this is this the belief that, that humans are um, story or narrative making creatures? Like we 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 naturally come around stories. Like even even this podcast and, and the conversation we're having, you're, you're I'm telling my story and you're interacting with my story and pulling bits out. And we're exploring a story together. Like we have always come around that. And then you look at all of our myths and all of our belief systems, all of our structures and our societies, and even the idea of human rights. Like these are stories that we tell ourselves. And sure, I think we should look after some of the stories like human rights. So I'd like to keep that story alive if that's okay. And we can talk about the ethics behind that. But the, these are just stories that the whole way that we view the world and we view and interact with each other is, is through a through a network of stories that we're all telling each other. It's absolutely fascinating. It's like it's like social contracts, like even money, like and this is a really, really weird tangent, but even money is just essentially a, a story that we're telling each other. Like, I'm gonna give you this useless bit of something you're going to give me an apple and we need to work out how how we can make this work in a society where you have 200 apples i have i don't know um some glass bottles and i can't trade apples for glass bottles so let's create something that's going to help us to actually begin to live within some sort of structure that works we create a story or a network to begin to cooperate this is what a religion is that's fascinating. What a what an interesting way of putting that, Sam. Uh, I think that that works on so many different levels. You could give many examples, not just money, right? But like, there's just so many ways how we've evolved to develop these. 
sometimes beautiful narratives. Like I get it. There's some ugly crap in the Old Testament. Got it. I, 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 that's not my moral code. I don't go to the Old Testament to know how to live. But I still read these things and I go, interesting. Like I just think they're fascinating mythos. There's some ugly things in our past. I don't recommend anyone living by. But I still like learning about them. It's, it's really interesting to understand where we came from and why. So Mr. Monster Super Chatty said, I started Jewish and Christian, became sort of atheist, mostly Jewish. Now I'm an animist. I do believe the universe is alive, but it can't talk to us. Interesting. Interesting. Do you have a thought on that, Sam? Um, bits and pieces. I think the, the sort of closest area to exploration where I come with that would probably be consciousness. Which I, I find it an absolutely fascinating conversation. Like what is consciousness? Um, how do we interact with it? Does it interact with us? Um, the sort of the sort of ideas around um, you know kind of emergent consciousness or um, um, panpsychism or different ways of, of of viewing the world. And uh, that's a space that I'm I'm going to be heavily exploring on the podcast eventually. But I think that's probably the closest to the the universe that I could get to at this point. But um, yeah, it's, it's a topic which I would go on for for hours. So I won't do it now. Yeah, no. And I mean, it's super complex understanding how organic matter would over periods of time under certain circumstances like abiogenesis, right, to develop what we are. It's just, you know, I like what Neil deGrasse Tyson said. And I think he said this because he may be able to wrap his mind over the idea that this might be natural, that it could be that th there are probably I mean, we just don't have the complete. Here's the exact history of how abiogenesis actually happened. We know exactly where on planet Earth or whatever, like like no. But he says the universe doesn't have to make sense to us. I mean, we didn't understand things for how many like a couple hundred thousand years, we understood certain things about survival, how to survive as the mechanism we were. But like we act like we're supposed to have all these answers. And if we don't know, right, we don't have all those answers. Christianity is true. So there's still there's still a leg to stand on. Right. At what point do you finally realize like, OK, hold on, hold on. I'm better off at least being agnostic and not actually sitting here positing a truth claim because I just don't know. That'd be better to just say that I am openly biased by saying I'm leaning in a naturalist point of view. I think that based on my experience is all I can. I don't know with a positive certainty that this is the case, but what makes the most sense to me as I put my faith, if you will, in what I have observed and experienced and tested, I have seriously sought after Jesus. I have cried out. I have had euphoric experiences, raising my hands and releasing the chemicals that are in my brain to experience these things. And I'm saying that was all natural, even though I thought it was spiritual, supernatural, tingling in my hands while I was speaking in tongues for hours to the same rhythm of a song in a church. Do you think something's going to happen? Sure. If you fast for seven days and don't eat, do you think you might see something? Sure. If you don't sleep for five days in a row, all of that's natural. And I just say that makes the most sense to me. We don't have to posit ghost, spiritual, supernatural, any of that, in my opinion. And I do think it's quite interesting that you and me are what we are talking about these things, sitting on a podcast, having these conversations. People go, you're blind, Derek. Don't you see it? Look at how complex you are communicating with Sam on the other side of this microphone. This is beyond your comprehension. Don't you get it? Something had to do this. And I get it. I understand. I've thought about all this stuff. And I'm saying maybe the universe just doesn't quite make sense. We're not, we're not quite as developed in understanding all these things yet. But maybe a natural one makes the most sense. That's my, that's my own hunch right now, you know? Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's, I mean, you, you can look at the world and be absolutely blown away time and time again. Like we believe that the moon was created by an asteroid hitting the earth, ripping a massive chunk out of it. And then both of them consolidating again. Like that's how we believe the moon. The moon is essentially a chunk of earth that was ripped out by an asteroid. Um, if you look at a rock, there are more holes in a rock than there is solid matter. Um, your eyes don't allow you to see that, but that's the reality of it. Um, and I think it's every 10 years or so, every single atom in the human body is switched out. So you're never made of the same things every decade. And like, there are so many <laughs> incredible things with, within this world that we're like, that's insane. But that doesn't mean God's true. Like, if, if yeah. you want to say God's true, present an argument, explain to me how we can interact with that, and we can go from there. I'm happy to have the conversation, but this world is incredible, and it's insane, and there's so much we can go away and explore and, and stand in awe and wonder at. We don't need to deposit a God to have that awe and wonder. Uh, God comes secondary after the awe and wonder. 
I really enjoyed this podcast, by the way, Sam. I really want to do this again with you. How we view the world should not become pessimistic or we shouldn't feel defensive in light of everyone around us looking at us going, why aren't you still drinking the Kool-Aid? We need to have the community online that we do continue doing these shows, letting other people know that we find more wonder now in the world than we ever did with our script. Our New Testament script told us how to look at the world, how to understand things. There's some beautiful things in there. Don't get me wrong. We know this. We we grew up on this. But there's some really not accurate and harmful ideological things that are in there that make us view ourselves as less than dirt. And when you really start thinking about the, this God and the ideas about it, I know why Christians end up saying how beautiful that a God would care so much to send a son. I know it. I like the narrative, right? But you're starting with false premises. That's the problem. And we want you guys to see that we're all humans. We love you for being humans. We get it. We don't have all the answers. We know that no one has all the answers. But if we can at least go that far, I think Christianity doesn't start with we don't have the answers. It starts with we have the truth. We know the truth. And in fact, everything else is a dichotomy. Everything else is wrong that isn't in this vein. And there's a big, big problem here in that worldview. So, Sam, how do people go and, and support you? How do they uh, go and maybe see your content? You have a podcast as well that isn't just YouTube. You release this stuff like 12 hours before you ever put it on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So um, the podcast goes live on a Wednesday morning here in the UK. So one goes live tomorrow morning uh, for us. And then um, I basically edit the uh, edit the Zoom conversation and upload it to YouTube on Wednesday evening. So it'd be probably be kind of lunchtime for, for the American viewers. Um, but yeah, if you just search for When Belief Dies um, on Google, you'll find me all over the shop. Um, but yeah, check us out on YouTube. Um, it's been great, mate. I've really, really enjoyed talking today. Thank you so much. I, I, I see an upcoming uh, episode where we talk about psychedelics. Uh, and our, have you had experience with them? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Same here. Um, I really look forward to maybe talking about what you think there, because there are some people, Jordan Peterson, uh, others, for example, who are actually using this as an argument for theism uh, in a way. I've heard them debate Matt Delahunty and stuff and talk about this. And it's like, he's like, there's just no way without the, um, without the experience that comes with the ingestion of psychedelics, you need to have that awakening experience for these things to happen. People quit smoking cigarettes, people quit addictions, people are life's changed uh, permanently from one experience. And um, I'd like to talk to you about some of that stuff and give you my own little personal insights because I definitely think it's touching, it's tapping into things, but I don't, I, I don't see why we're positing divine in that. It, it, if he means like a psychological thing and he's saying that that's somehow divine, uh, potatoes or tomatoes, tomatoes, whatever. I don't know why we're having to do the Carl Jung thing, so to speak, though I think there's some wisdom in it. I just don't see any reason to posit that this proves God, but it'll be interesting to get into psychedelics and understand maybe it's history. You probably know a lot more about that than I do. Yeah, I'd be well up for that. That sounds exciting. Awesome, man. Seriously, I appreciate you. Look, uh, Gibson says, love you, brother. Floki, much love, Lee. Do you know who this is? Yeah, I do. Hi, Lee. Good to see you, man. <laughs> man, this has been a wonderful podcast. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. Sorry if I've hogged any of the show. Uh, I connected really well with you, though, and I think that we have much more we could share with other people. Yeah, thanks, bro. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Don't forget, go down into the description, even in the chat right now. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Uh, show him why he wants to come back you know make it worth his while subscribe get that channel to grow more people familiar when belief dies and he's extremely polite so you could tell he's not antagonistic he's far more calm than i am in the way that he approaches these things so you know he's not gonna hurt nobody go check him out also the patreon i can't tell you guys there's so much i put on there um you can personally message me if you want to talk as well as get questions answered by scholars you hit that load more button and you're open for trouble. There's so much content. Thank you so much. Let's do this again, my friend. Take All right. Care. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're lost, you just don't have that group that you can be part of. You know, myth vision is all for it, right? We want you to be part of the group. We want you to see that the outcasts, the people who are being critical of the things that were once raised in, you can find that here. We 
are. Myth Vision.